if I keep my uh, camera on while I'm trying to talk. So this evening I'm going to visit a little bit about soils and plant nutrients. And so what is soil? Uh, you know, soil is under our feet. Um, sometimes we track it into the kitchen and when we do that we call it dirt. Um, but when it's out in the pasture, uh, out in the garden, we call it soil. And while it may look like one just similar thing, soil is actually composed of, of four different components. You have the mineral component of the soil, which makes up almost half of the soil, about 45%. You have that organic matter component to the soil, which is, you know, 5% or so in a good soil. And then 50% of your soil is actually air and water kind of filling in the spaces between the uh, mineral particles and the organic mineral and the organic particles in the soil. So it's a mixture of these four things. And so um, if you drive around the state and even if you drive around your property, you probably notice that your soil can vary quite a bit from one location to the other. And that's because the mineral part of the soil is made up of many different size particles, um, really three different size particles. You've got um, clay, which are the smallest particles, and really an individual clay particle is really hard to see even with the, with the naked eye. And then you have silt particles, which are a little bit larger, and then you have sand, which, which is even larger still. And then when it gets above sand, then they start calling it gravel or rocks. Uh, to put it into perspective, um, if you look at the particle of sand and you were looking at some, some balls in the uh, uh, sporting goods section of the store, that sand would be about the size of a beach ball. And the silt particle would be about the size of a golf ball. And uh, that clay particle would be about the size of a BB just to kind of put them into perspective with each other. So you can have, you know, a thousand or more clay particles in the same space where you would have a sand particle. And so that's the mineral component of your soil. And all of that comes from decomposed rocks, rocks that are that have been broken down over time. And then you have that organic matter content in the soil. And that can be many different things. That can be roots of plants that have died. That could be plants that have died. Um, that could be um, compost that you've added to the soil. That could be um, something you've tilled in, chicken litter, anything along those lines. Um, dead earthworms, things like that. Uh, those are things that were living at one time and now um, are now part of the soil. And so that's your organic matter content. And then of course, we know about air and we know about water and all those go together to make a really good soil. So how are soils made? Soils are made uh, over a long period of time by rocks breaking down and weathering. You've got wind that acts on rocks and breaks them down. You've got freezing and thawing uh, in the winter time. You've got rain. And then if you look at that bottom left, you've kind of got some lichens or algae growing on rocks. Over time, plants, small plants like lichens and algae, um, get roots going down into little bitty cracks in a rock. Those roots expand and they break off fragments of rocks and then eventually larger plants uh, get their roots in there and eventually the, the rock particles just go get broken down further and further. And of course these things take many, many years to, to happen. Um, and then the organic matter, uh, the leaves that fall from the trees in the winter time, um, the grass that you've mowed in the yard, that starts to get decomposed by many different things, uh, mainly fungi, bacteria. It gets eaten by an earthworm and excreted out the other end. A dung beetle takes um, the animal manure and buries it in the ground. A mole or a gopher pushes soil up or fire ants push soil up um, and, and kind of enclose the organic matter into 
their burrow and over time that stuff gets broken down and of course man can do the same thing with with disking and plowing and things like that and so over time the organic matter gets incorporated into the soil too soils um, have many different layers so it's if you were to take a backhoe and make a slice down through your property uh, at different locations you would notice color changes uh, possibly texture changes of the size of particles and the color of that uh, slice there of the soil and so um, that layer right at the top maybe the top couple inches is the area that's going to be more impacted by the organic matter and the action of roots growing with trees and and other things other crops and plants now the soil that you have on your property um, is is mainly a result of environmental and uh, weather conditions over the years whether or not your place is close to a river or something like that um, and then basically what was there you know when the earth was formed and so not all soils are alike soils come in in many different textures and scientists use a triangle like this that's called the soil texture triangle to uh, classify soils so that when they're talking about soils um, they they have a common place to start with and a, a common uh, language to use when they're discussing and so um, you know soils that have predominantly clay are going to be toward the top of this pyramid um, soils that have predominantly silt in them are going to be to the right and those that have predominantly sand in them are going to be to the left and so we can't really change the soil very much where we have our property uh, but knowing what that soil is composed of is is important for us when we're trying to make some management decisions and so um, if you don't know what your soil is like on your property there are some ways to find that out and we're going to talk about them here in just a minute but uh, if you want something to do this weekend you can get you a mason jar uh, put some soil in it uh, put some water in it to cover it up and shake it up and let it sit no. and and um, do we have, do we have a question okay um you can shake it up and let it sit and that area that that layer that'll settle out in about a minute that's the heaviest particles the sand and then that that settles out in a couple hours is the silt and then it could take a few days for the clay layer to settle out but the clay layer will eventually settle out and you'll have water on top and you'll have some stuff floating and that stuff that's floating is going to be your organic matter so here's an example of, of somebody that did this and you can then go back and measure uh, the depth of the soil in the jar and get your relative percentages of your sand silt and clay and and use that to help you determine what your soil is like you can um, have a soil texture analysis done at a soil lab like the A&M soil testing lab in College Station you can pay them to do a professional analysis of your soil texture there uh, or you can go to a website uh, a couple of different websites actually to um, see what your soil looks like there uh, this is the United States Department of Agriculture's web soil survey y'all may have had a speaker talk about this um, previously but the web soil survey is a free website that you can go to uh, the link to the website is down there at the bottom you could probably just get on and, and Google um, USDA web soil survey and I'm sure it would um, pull it up for you but um, once you get to the website you just click on that green button that says start web soil survey and it will you can go in there and um, put in an address and when you put in an address it will bring up an aerial map and with about 15 to 20 minutes of kind of playing with it you can um, find out what the soil is like on your property this is 
the aerial map that pulls up for our fairgrounds here in Clarksville. And um, if you'll go in and you can overlay it and, and ask for, you'll select that area. I don't know if I can do it live. I think it'll eat up too much of our time and I don't know if it'll go to the site. Um, but you'll, you'll, you'll go in there and you'll input your address and it'll bring up a satellite view and then you will make an area of interest, which is basically you making a rectangular box. And once you pick of the property area that you're wanting to look at and you'll click uh, soils or soil profile and it will tell you what's there below the soil. And so I did that for our fairgrounds and uh, would find out that it's a barless and clay, not considered some of it's not considered a prime farmland and if you've ever been out to our fairgrounds in the summertime you know that um, it can have big cracks and in the and in the winter when it's raining um, your tires get taller as you drive across it uh, because it is very clay and so the web soil survey is a very powerful website that you can look at again i don't have enough time tonight to go into it in great detail but um, you can certainly get on there when you have time. One that may be a little bit easier to use that, that is a little bit more intuitive and user friendly. Uh, the University of California at Davis has another website that they call the Soil Web. And um, the email ad or the URL is down there at the bottom as well. Uh, you could probably just Google UC Davis Soil Web and it'll bring up a satellite view. You will go in and put in the address where you're interested in learning about, or you can put in the, the GPS coordinates and it will pull it up. And um, these little yellow, uh, like topographic circles or, or lines here represent different soil types um, on the property. And uh, you just click, if we were live on the website, you just click and when you click on it, oops, when you click on it, it's not going to do that, but when you click on it, it'll put a little X in the spot and it'll bring up what's over here on the left and it'll bring up um, information about the soil that's there and the different characteristics of that soil. So these are two websites that you uh, might want to look at if you're wanting to if you just have some property that you're not as familiar with and you're wanting to learn more about it, um, you cannot get as close a detail with the UC Davis website. That's about as close a scale as you can get um, about like that. Whereas the uh, USDA soil web, web soil survey, you can get a little bit closer about like this. So again, um, the, the UC Davis one may be easier to use, but you may not be able to um, go in quite as close on a, on a property uh, to, look at, to look at it. So that's just a brief um, kind of review for you all about soils and um, you know, how to learn a little bit more, where you can go for information about your soil. If you, you can also go into your extension office or to your uh, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Office and they still make a book um, that you can look at that has plates uh, that they took about 20 years ago of the properties and you can find the map of your property and look on the map and you'll see uh, their estimate there on the map of the soil that's below your property and you can still look it up using using the book or using a printed book. So now let's talk for a few minutes about soil and plants. Um, as you all know, um, you know, plants are dependent upon the soil to get their water and, and the nutrients that they need to grow. And so uh, this graphic just kind of depicts that the plants get energy from the sun and is light energy or photons of light. Uh, they undergo photosynthesis where they produce 
um, sugars that feed the plant and the proteins needed to grow and, and everything. Uh, and they take in carbon dioxide and they let off oxygen and they also use oxygen and let off carbon dioxide and they're releasing water and that, that they're getting these nutrients from the soil. And uh, so over the years, you know, scientists have discovered and, and learned that there are 16 different nutrients that are essential for plant growth. Uh, the three the plants need the most are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and all those come from the air and the water. And then the the primary nutrients, the the ones that they need that they get from the soil that they need in the greatest amounts are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We call those the primary macronutrients because they need a lot of them. And then there's another level of nutrients that they need a lot of, but not quite as much as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And those are ones we call the secondary macronutrients. That's sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And then you can see there's another seven that they need in smaller amounts. And we call those the micronutrients. And those are iron, boron, manganese, copper, zinc, molybdenum, and chlorine. And so, you know, the plants are dependent on those nutrients to grow and the plants can't uh, get up and move. So if they're not in the soil, um, you may have to supplement those. And not a nutrient, but essential to plant utilization of nutrients is pH. And pH has to do with the hydrogen ion activity in the soil water solution. And that's a measure when you when somebody talks about their soil and they say, well, my soil is acid or my soil is alkaline. That pH is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of your soil. And some plants um, like blueberries like a really acid soil and other plants uh, are not as finicky. Um, typically, a lot of the forage type plants We'll do okay with the pH of between about five and eight, but um, they do a little bit better when the when the soil is a little bit closer to seven or neutral on that pH scale. So if your soil pH is lower than you'd like it to be, um, then you can modify the soil by adding a, a, a limestone or something like that. Uh, in gardening, if the pH is too high, we can sometimes add sulfur to get it down for specific crops like blueberries or something like that. Um, but again, most of our soils, a, a range of about six to seven is kind of what we're looking for. And the thing about pH is that affects or influences the availability of the nutrients to the plants. So this graph, although rather busy, um, kind of depicts the pH of a soil going from a four to a nine, so from very acid to very alkaline. And as the lines for a particular uh, nutrient get closer to each other, that's showing that that nutrient is less available at that pH than it is at a different pH level. So if you kind of draw a line going down from about 5.5 over to about 6.5 for most of the nutrients, especially the macronutrients, the ones the plants need the most, that's kind of the range when they're um, most available to the uh, plants, um, whereas the plants can take them, take those nutrients away from the soil particles when the pH is in that range. And so uh, that's why we often try to keep our pH in a range like that uh, so that we get efficient utilization of the nutrients in the soil or the fertilizer that we purchase to, uh, to uh, put on our soil. So if your pH is too low, um, you can add some liming materials. Uh, we typically use limestone, which is calcium carbonate. Uh, it comes in many different forms. Um, most of the time for a pasture, we're looking at something like a, a ground limestone. Um, if it's a ground limestone that's a little higher in magnesium, 
Sometimes you'll hear it called a dolomitic limestone. Um, and not all limestone, if you, if you find yourself needing to lime a soil to raise the pH, just realize that not all limestone is created equally. The parent material, the fineness of the material go together into an equation uh, that makes up something called the effective calcium carbonate equivalence. So a pure material that is finer ground will have a higher ECCE, effective calcium carbonate equivalence. And so that'll be a better quality product. It will react with the soil to help raise the pH um, more efficiently. And uh, the soil lab, the a and soil lab will give you a recommendation. If they give you a recommendation for adding lime to your soil, realize that that's based upon a fictional product that's a 100% ECCE, whereas the products that you purchase may be 60 to 70% ECCE. And so you'll have to do a little bit of math and add a little bit more product to it so that you get the amount of lime that you need out there to, to do what you'd like to do. So then we have fertilizers. If we're going to change this, the the nutrient levels in our soil, we, we would be looking at fertilizer. We talked a few minutes ago about the three major macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And I'll, I'll just focus on them in the time that we have remaining. Uh, Nitrogen is the primary macronutrient. It is a main component of chlorophyll. So the plants need chlorophyll to conduct photosynthesis. And nitrogen is also part of amino acids, which go into making protein. Nitrogen is really mobile in the plant, and it's very mobile in the soil. Um, and so um, plants that become deficient in nitrogen, you will often see that deficiency, especially in crops, showing up as a yellowing in the older leaves of the plant. Now, 78% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen, uh, but it's not in a form that plants can use. Um, legumes are a special class of plants that um, have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in their root nodules that the bacteria can take the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and use it to make nitrogen that the plant can use to grow, but our grasses can't do that. Um, plants use nitrogen primarily in the ammonium and nitrate forms. And I will make available to Casey a copy of this presentation to send out to y'all, but nitrogen goes lots of different places. Uh, this graphic just kind of shows us that when nitrogen is added to the soil, some of it volatilizes and goes up into the atmosphere. Uh, some of it leaches out in the water when it rains. Some is eaten by the animals and, uh, and becomes part of the animal. And some goes into the milk uh, production, um, et cetera, uh, production into to, hay or something like that. So nitrogen moves around a lot and it moves out of uh, your pasture rather easily. Uh, typical nitrogen fertilizers are ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, and urea. Those are the ones that, that you will typically get in a blend um, or purchase to put out on, on, on your property. Phosphorus, the middle number on your fertilizer bag, one of the other macronutrients, is needed for reproduction, root development, and seedling vigor. Now, phosphorus doesn't move much in the soil. Um, it, it doesn't follow the, follow the water down through the soil column when it rains. Um, it, it, it can build up in the soil because of that. And over time, if we use too much manure uh, in their soil as uh, is a, is a fertilizer source, um, we do run the risk of getting our phosphorus levels too high. But uh, the plant roots basically grow into the phosphorus, grow up to the phosphorus and, and find it. Um, plants that are deficient will look kind of stunted in purple. 
like nitrogen, phosphorus cycles through the animals. It cycles um, through uh, the pasture. And uh, typically, if we're buying phosphorus, uh, it's going to be part of a fertilizer like diammonium phosphate um, or something like that. Potassium, the third macronutrient, um, you'll often hear it called potash. Uh, potassium has to do with energy transfer, um, carbohydrate and protein synthesis. It has a lot to do with um, overall health uh, of the roots and um, the health of the forage stand. Um, and it has a lot to do with the opening and closing uh, the stomatal openings, those openings in the leaves that allow the plants to take in carbon dioxide, release oxygen, and um, also let off water vapor. Excuse me for, I don't know if y'all can hear it, but I hope that they're testing the um, tornado warnings here in town because the uh, alarm system is going off, the, the sirens are going off in town, but Based upon the weather, I think they're just testing them this evening, but it's going rather loudly in the background here. I can't um, hear it. So Y'all don't hear it? Good. Okay, I'm glad it's not bleeding through, but I've been hearing it for about the last two minutes solid. No, you're good. So, you're okay. coming so, up on seven o'clock. So yeah, I know. I'm almost okay. done. Good A couple more slides. So pot deal. potassium cycles through the pasture, just like um, the other nutrients do. And... Uh, 0060 potassium chloride, 0050 are the typical potassium fertilizers um, that can be purchased uh, as a standalone or put into a blend to supply fertilizer for your pasture. So let's have a little quiz here. Let's say you've got these 500 pound calves out in your pasture. Um, about how much of that calf is nitrogen? How much of that calf is phosphorus? How much of that calf is potassium? Anybody want to wrangle a guess? Anybody want to try? It, well, that's okay. Um, you'd be surprised at um, how little is actually in the animal. You know, the animals, if you were to take the, the entire uh, nutrient composition of that animal, they have about 12 and a half pounds of nitrogen in that 500 pound calf, about three and a half pounds of phosphorus and smaller amounts of the other nutrients. So the rest of that calf is, is water, um, you know, and things like that. So the animals are eating the grass and they're digesting it, taking the nutrients out of it that their body needs and then recycling most of that back out into your pasture at various locations wherever they drop a, a you know their feces or urinate so they're recycling a lot of that back in a pasture when you're grazing and so as dr olson will probably talk about later the more efficient you can make that deposition of feces and urine around a pasture the better you'll spread that back around um, if you're baling hay, it's a little bit different story. Uh, when you bale hay, you're growing a forage that's got nutrients in it, you're harvesting it, and then you're taking it somewhere else to feed it. So you're transporting nutrients away from your property, uh, or at least from that field. It may stay on your property and be fed somewhere else. But um, this table down here kind of shows you that if you had a thousand pound roll of hay, it's got about 21 pounds of nitrogen in it. Okay, so it's got about 21 pounds of nitrogen in it, about five pounds of phosphorus, and about 24 pounds of potash. So um, that thousand pound roll, uh, if we take it somewhere else and feed it, those nutrients went wherever that roll went, okay? And if that cow is eating it in another field, when they're depositing uh, their, their urine and feces, they're moving those nutrients from your hay field somewhere else. So 
that's why we are usually, or that's why we're going to have to fertilize, you know, hay, hay fields, um, you know, a lot more aggressively than we will a grazing pasture because we're not recycling the nutrients there. And if you kind of put a pencil to it, um, I did this calculation last week, there's about $16 worth of nutrients in that 1,000 pound roll of hay, plus whatever it costs you to have it uh, cut and baled. So um, there's nutrients leaving. So if you're going to manage any kind of pasture, any kind of forage efficiently, you need to do some soil testing. And um, you need to do soil testing, and that gives you kind of a snapshot of what's in your soil at that time, and that can help you make decisions based upon what you plan to do with that piece of land. Is it going to be a grazing pasture? Is it a hay field? Um, if it's a hay field, we've got to fertilize it a whole lot more to keep the stand healthy um, and to keep our production up. If it's a grazing pasture, um, if we're rotating, uh, maybe moving mineral blocks and things like that around a little bit, uh, we may move our fecal patties and such a little bit more efficiently and, and, and uh, help spread those nutrients back around. But uh, soil testing is inexpensive, uh, but it's one of the best investments that you can make um, for your property. So with that, I'm about out of time for today. Um, Casey's trying to keep me on track and she's almost did a good job of that. So I've got time maybe for a question or two, or if not, we'll turn it over to uh, Matt. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, the only one somebody asked if we were giving out um, CEUs for yes. pesticide applicators, and so we are not doing that this time around. Um, right. I'm sure we're going to have some future programs where we will offer CEU credit hours for pesticide license holders. So Yes. That's a future one. Matt, it's all you. All right, it should be coming up. Yep. I'll see it. I see it, but it's not in the presenter yeah, presentation Yeah, I'm getting mode. there. Give me a second. Okay. My computer moves really slow. Once it gets going, it'll be fine. It's just got to get there. Oh. It doesn't like me mul clicking on multiple things real quickly. All right, Casey, it should be good now, right? Yep, you look good. All right. All right, well, I already introduced myself earlier, but I'll introduce myself again. My name is Matthew March, and I'm going to cover today some of our common forages we see here in East Texas. And I've been told that I like to go over, so I'm going to do my best to try to get through this in 30 minutes. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to move pretty fast, but and I do apologize. Some of the slides are kind of wordy, but I wanted to get all this information to you all because I feel like as a new, as a landowner, you should from this, I want you to be able to determine what forage best fits your operation and your management goals. So we're going to go through it pretty quick, but you can go back and watch the recording later and look at the details more fine, finely. I also want to say I'm not a forage expert by any means. Uh, Dr. Olson is the forage expert coming up. So if y'all got any tough questions, leave them for her, not me. Uh, a lot of the information I'm going to cover today is just a lot of my personal experience from managing about 350 acres of forage for cattle and hay. So with that, we'll get started. So just a little bit background on, I guess, just plants in general and forage production. We usually break up plants into like two different categories. And this pie, y'all, this pie is review for most of y'all, but we have annual and we have perennial forages. So annual forages are ones that they complete their whole life cycle in one growing season. So at the start of the growing season, they germinate from seed, then they get larger and bigger, they put on leaves, and then eventually they'll go into a reproductive stage where they make a seed and then the plant dies basically, and then the seed drops to the ground and then the seed lays dormant until the next growing season and then it starts the cycle over again. Compare that to a perennial type forage, which the life cycle lasts multiple growing seasons in which 
It does the same thing at the start of the growing season. It starts putting out shoots as the annual plant, but instead of from a seed germinating from a seed, the new shoots come from rootstock that's laying dormant in the ground. And then the same thing, it goes through its life cycle. It completes it at the end of the growing season. But then when the plant goes dormant, the rootstock still stay viable into the ground until next year. So that's just the difference between annual and perennial. And that's important to know when you're picking a forage crop to determine if you want to plant something every year or do you want something that comes back every growing season. And then the other thing you need to consider is warm season and cool season. Uh, I can ask you all if you all think what's the most common thing here is warm and cool season forages. You don't have to answer that, but most of you all probably realize that most of our grasses grow during the warm season or summertime. So that's stuff that starts germinating in mid spring and then goes through spring, summer, and usually um, goes dormant at the first frost. Compared that to cool season forages, it, most of them can germinate as early as about September and then through fall into December. And then they grow some in winter, but even though we call it cool season forages, a lot of our cool season crops or forage crops a lot of their production is actually more in the springtime, so that's just something to keep in mind. So this is just a very rough graph I came up with. This isn't based off of anything at all other than just kind of my own experience and knowledge, but just to compare warm to cool season grasses or forage crops. So you got your months at the bottom and then on the going up and down on the uh, vertical you have your percent of production for a total year so like if you're looking at warm season crops you might see five roughly five percent of your total production occurs in March so that makes sense so you germinate in spring and then you slowly increase and then a lot of our warm season crops usually hit a peak when we're starting to get real warm we're still getting a lot of rain in that late spring early early summertime May into June and then depending on rainfall if we get rainfall it'll stay pretty it'll stay up pretty high, but a lot of times during the dog days of summer, like we're in now, or if we start getting into dry spells and it gets real hot, you'll see a little dip down in July and August, and then it'll go back up a little bit when we start getting some fronts and some rain in September, and then it'll go back down until we get our first frost. And then on the other side of that, you have your cool season forages, which we already kind of mentioned germinate in that September to November period. And then they do some growth in the fall, but and then they kind of kind of hold steady slash not very much during December and January. And then they really hit that peak come February, March and April. Um, one thing to remember with the cool season forages, and we're going to talk about this when we get to them, that growth curve can vary a lot depending on what your species is. Some of our cool season forages grow a lot more in the fall and winter compared to some that do almost 90 percent of their total production just during like that February to May time period. So before we really get into it, and this is going to be a little, I guess, introduction to what what locations we're actually covering today. I mean, obviously we're covering East Texas, but what really is East Texas? So I got this ecological map of East Texas. I know that's very in depth. Y'all don't have to go memorize this, but you know, we're in the Piney Woods, which would be kind of that light bluish area to the far east greenish color and then some of y'all might be in the post what we call the post oak savannah which is that orange and yellow area to the west and then if some of y'all are up around dallas or back further west you might be in the blackland prairie and you may be asking why am i talking about ecological regions when we're talking about forages well my point with this is is i want y'all as a landowner to understand many of our native forages even though that they are excellent options for livestock in some instances really are no longer present and you'll see this in the next few slides where i'm going to show you what native forages historically look like in east texas most of our what we would call native east texas habitats have been heavily altered or degraded or have changed since we you know became texas and settled this country this state so nearly all our native forages have been replaced by non-native or improved type forages. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. We like our improved forages. I mean, they grow great, that high yielding, high production, high nutritional content. But I want you to understand as a landowner, especially I know some of y'all might need new landowners and one of your goals might not just be forage production for cattle. You might also want to include some wildlife benefits or some conservation benefits to it. So in certain cases, you as a landowner, you might want to actually grow native forages because that can benefit both your wildlife 
and your cattle. So that's just kind of a little background here. But with all that being said, we're going to spend very little bit of this talk actually on native forages because 95% probably of what we actually grow in East Texas for forage production is improved type non-native forages compared out to more arid locations in West Texas where native rangelands are still a very important part of livestock production. So just real quick, if you were in the Piney Woods 150, 200 years ago, a lot of it would look like this. This would be a pine savanna, a lot of grass. Most of the Piney Woods doesn't look like this anymore. All the open understory is gone. Same thing with the post oak savanna. If you're further west, it's pretty much all been choked out by yo pond. Now I know this is a bad picture, but the Blackland Prairie was historically a tall grass prairie, which has been pretty much been replaced by improved forages. But historically, our native forages in these eco regions in pretty much East Texas would have been what we call the big four, which left to right on this slide would be little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and big blue stem. All of these are great forages. They just really don't exist anymore in East Texas. You can still see them along some of the highways and right of ways and maybe in a few hay fields, but they're pretty much non-existent. So one more slide on native versus improved forages until we get into which I'll probably really want to hear about. So native forages, a lot of times we call lesser quality forages. And I put that in parentheses because yeah, it might not be as high yielding as improved forages or have high nutritional content or protein content, but they're not really lesser because they're native here to East Texas. So they're native to our weather. And so they grow really good here in their native. To, they are adapted to our soil. So you don't have to do a lot of fertilizer inputs to them. And because they are, they evolved here and they're natural here, you don't have a lot of the insect issues and disease issues you see with improved forages. And so the other thing you got to consider native forages are a lot more sensitive to grazing. So your livestock stocking rate is going to be a lot less than something in like an improved Bermuda grass field. But on the flip side of that, you get your wildlife benefit and conservation benefits out of it. So we kind of already touched on that. But when you compare it to improved forages, improved forages are generally considered higher quality. You can have higher stocking rates. And it makes that, I'm not, I want to make sure y'all know I'm not suggesting one over the other. I'll, I personally manage everything from little native blue stem forages to Bermuda grass, so I'm not indifferent to either one, but improved, a lot of our improved fit past forages gets that nice clean looking pasture you want to have on your place. It looks really nice, makes it look like a showcase place, but it doesn't have that wildlife benefit you see to it. While it's pretty much a wildlife desert if you're just growing one type of grass or forage on your place. And then improved forage, as I said, a lot of high inputs, fertilizer, lime, insecticides, you get through disease issues, you're basically becoming crop production, but you get a lot more inputs, but in the reverse, you get a high value hay or a high value forage crop to graze your cattle on. So everything else is gonna be about improved forages now. Uh, this is obviously not a complete list of improved forages, but for the sake of time, I should have even probably made it smaller, but this is what I think is probably the most common forages we see here in East Texas on the improved side, with Bahay and Bermuda by far being the most common. And we're going to run through all this real quick, and you'll kind of see a, a rhyme to this. We're going to I'm going to introduce you to each plant, just a little bit of growth and ID history, then we'll show some pictures, and then just kind of some pros and cons for each plant or each forage crop. Uh, so Bahia, it's a warm season perennial. I get asked a lot of times, how do I ID Bahia? Uh, to me, that seems pretty simple, but I know a lot of y'all being new landowners, somebody might have never actually showed you what Bahia grass actually looks like. So pretty much if you go out on your place and you see a two branch seed head grass and you pull it up and it's got a large scaly rhizome on it, that's Bahia grass. And we're gonna show you pictures of that here on the next slide. But if you won't know what a rhizome is, it's basically an underground stem, underground root or stem that goes underground horizontally, and then it shoots roots up, and then it shoots stems up as it goes and basically makes another plant. Bahia grass is known for forming very dense sods, which is one of the benefits to it, and it can get up to about two feet tall. But usually when we want to graze it or cut it for hay, we want to keep it down below at least a foot, if not closer to eight to 10 inches. So here's a picture of Bahia grass. There's nothing else that's going to have that seed head on it. It's usually two. Sometimes you can see on the picture on the right, it'll get a third fork in there. But if you pull up the roots and it's got this really gnarly looking root rhizome on it, you got Bahia grass. 
So some of the pros and cons, and we're, like I said, we're going to run through this pretty quick, but y'all can come back and compare these later. Is The hay grass is pretty adapted to a wide range of soils, so it does really good here in East Texas, especially here in Polk County. It seems to just grow everywhere here in Deep East Texas. And because of that, it's so well adapted, it's basically come naturally established. Everybody's got bahia grass in their pastures or hay fields, unless they're actively trying to manage for some other type of forage crop. So that's good because it does real good on its own. We don't have to do a lot, a whole lot for it. So because of that, you have less input requirements, fertilizer, stuff like that. But you do need to keep in mind, it does persist in really low soil pH and without adding much fertilizer to it. But if you put a little bit of fertilizer on it, a little bit of lime, you'll get a lot more production out of it. You might not kill it at a really low pH, but you won't get that production you might want to reach. Uh, we mentioned it farms a really thick sod, and that helps a lot with, we don't have very many weed issues in Bahia when we compare it to Bermuda grass. Same thing with insect issues. It does well, it's pretty well drought tolerant for the most part, and it does pretty good in poor drainage areas also. And I call it a pro, it's, you can establish it from seed. You can just go down to the feed store and get you a sack of Bahia grass seed and go. Some of the cons for it, it's generally kind of considered as high quality as Bermuda grass. Now, with that being said, you cut a Bermuda grass when it's 20 inches tall and you cut Bahia grass when it's eight inches tall, you're probably, the Bahia grass is probably gonna be higher quality. It's all about when you graze that forage, how tall it is, how mature it is, or when you cut it, is going to base the quality, not just what species of forage grass you're growing or forage crop. Um, eight to 10 inches, I already mentioned that's your harvest height. I kind of consider that a con because bahia grass grows so quick and we get so much rain here in East Texas, you're going to have a hard time getting in that field and keeping it cut every 10 inches because that might be every three or four weeks if we're getting a lot of rain and and you're going to have a hard time getting a weather window to get that bahay out before it gets too tall and clumpy. So we see it a lot for pasture use, not so much for hay. I do have quite a few people down here in Deep East Texas that cut it for hay. Um, some of the things I've seen a lot personally with it, cutting bahay hay on my own hay forage crops is bailing issues. Uh, it doesn't like to dry real evenly in the wind row, especially if it's really thick. It likes to clump a lot going through the cutter. It likes to clump when you're trying to bail it. It just doesn't run, the system just doesn't run as smooth as when you're doing like Bermuda grass. Same thing, it's abrasive on the hay equipment. I have absolutely no idea why. I don't know if it's like the structure of the leaf compared to Bermuda grass, but you'll go through blades on a mower cutting bahia grass two to three times quicker than you will on Bermuda grass. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you want to plant a whole lot of bahia for hay production, it's going to be a little bit harder on your hay equipment, at least in my opinion. Um, seed costs can be kind of high. I seem to get a lot of calls about establishment issues down here in Polk County, so I threw that as a con. It seems like I get several calls pretty about once every month or so about uh, people having failed establishment with bahia grass. Uh, and it, another con, it's not very drought tolerant on sandy soils, and it's actually considered a weed if you're trying to grow Bermuda grass. So real quick on varieties, we got Pensacola and Argentina. That's what the two varieties you're going to see here in East Texas. There are some other varieties, but you never hardly come across them. Pensacola is the most common, mostly because it's cold tolerant. Um, they typically don't recommend Argentine much further north than like Polk County where I'm at because it lacks cold tolerance compared to Pensacola, but Argentine has been shown to have the equal amount of dry matter yield compared to Bermuda grass under similar growing conditions. All right, so that was Bahia grass. Now we're on to Bermuda grass, which is probably right up there is with Bahia grass as being the most common. I would say here in Polk County, Bahia grass is more common, but uh, it just depends on what county you're in, I'm sure. So Bermuda grass, another warm season perennial like Bahia. It also has rhizomes, so it has them vertical or yeah, horizontal, I mean, underground stems, but it also has what we call stolons, which is an above ground stem. And y'all, I'm sure all y'all probably seen Bermuda grass for, before. A lot of people will call it runners, which is the stem that grow, goes along the soil. And as that stem goes along, it puts down a root and it shoots up another Bermuda grass plant. And this is important here when we get to talking about 
establishment and variety. So just remember that that Bermuda grass does the majority of its uh, reproduction and spreading and establishment through rhizomes and stems st stolen. So underground and above ground stems. Uh, some of the varieties do reproduce by seeds and your seed vigor or fertility is going to be dependent on your variety of Bermuda. There's a lot of hybrids on the market and the hybrids are generally what people want. The downside to hybrids is all there. If you have a hybrid, its seed is going to be infertile. So you got to get a you basically got to transplant a rhizome and it's stolen onto your property. And that's what we call sprigging. If you ever heard the term sprigging before, it's basically somebody goes out to a stand of, of a hybrid Bermuda that's already established. They go through there with the machine. They dig up some roots, some stems of it. They go back and they sprig it or they plant it basically on your place with another machine. And that's that's how you get hybrid Bermuda started. And Bermuda can get about two feet tall if you let it. So here's just some quick pictures. I'm sure y'all have all seen Bermuda grass. You can see this, the vertical runners or the horizontal runners in the in the uh, pictures, which is out, which is important for Bermuda grass. So just real quick pros and cons. Bermuda is not only our most popular forage, I would say here in East Texas, but definitely across the South. And that's basically because of two reasons. It's the highest yielding improved forage we have, and it's by far the highest quality from a nutritional standpoint. Um, if the weather conditions are right and you got all your, I guess, your fertility right and your management right, you can go almost have a four week to month long haying intervals. So you could easily get four cuttings a year, if not five, depending on how far north y'all are and how long your growing season is. Bermuda grass Matt, is considered Matt, to be you got a couple questions if you want to chime in on them or if you want to wait. Um, yeah, we can chime in on them right now. Okay, so one is if you're using Bahia grass for pasture grazing for horses, should we still cut it at eight to 10 inches and just let it fall? And then can Bahia and Bermuda coexist and together and grow? Um, okay, so the first one, um, if I understand the question right, you're worried about the Bahia getting too tall and then the horse is not wanting to eat it. Um, no, I wouldn't cut it because, I mean, it's just going to lay there and the horses aren't going to eat it unless you're going to go in there and bale it. Um, I would say the horses are probably eating the Bahia grass short enough in a certain area. So, I mean, cattle do the same thing. I mean, they're grazing animals. They're going to graze in one spot over and over and over again because they're eating that fresh growth. So you might have one clump in your pasture where they're not really touching it because they're not, it's gotten too tall and they got another section where they've been grazing it constantly and it's shorter so they're eating it. What you could do is if you do have an over excessive amount of behavior grass and you're worried about your horses not eating it, you could get more horses, but the more simpler thing would be you go out there and shred them tall clumps and then that'll get you new growth that them horses will want to go eat off of. And then was, oh, Bahia and Bermuda grass coexisting. Um, yeah, I, I would assume they can coexist, but I would think over time one would probably outcompete the other one because either you're going to be managing for Bermuda or Bahia grass. Uh, if you got it in your pastures, you very well could have one, one area where Bermuda grass is established and one area where Bahia grass is established. But I would say Bahia grass, it form, well, I mean, Bermuda grass can form a really thick sod too that can help keep out weeds and other plants from coming up. But I would say Bahia would out would out compete Bermuda grass in the fact that if you have a really thick Bahia, Bahia grass stand, I don't see Bermuda coming up in it. But I could see if you have a Bermuda grass stand that gets a little weak and you get some Bahia started in there and you don't get the Bahia out of it and you maybe grace the Bermuda grass or the Bermuda a little bit too heavy, I could see the Bahia grass taking over over time. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Matt. And um, the Bahia grass, it stands grazing pressure a little bit better, yeah. I think. So if you're overgrazing both, or if you're overgrazing the Bermuda grass, then you know that makes the Bahia grass easier to take to try and take over. Um, yeah, I, I agree, and I tell people that a lot. I get a lot of people that come in here, you know, new landowners that got a clear cut piece of property and they want to plant some kind of Bermuda. 
And then I get to talking to them about all the management that needs to go along with that to really keep that stand up. Right. And usually I try to convince them to go Bahia because they're vacant landowners or they don't have that equipment to go out there and spray it two or three times a year and all that stuff that goes along with that. And we'll touch on that here in a little bit in this slide with the pros and cons. So like I said, Bermuda grass is considered very drought tolerant. It does very good on sandy soils, which is good for lots of parts of East Texas, especially all that are around Polk County here in deep East Texas. We got the hybrids, which are good because uh, the hybrids are known for either being more cold tolerant, more drought tolerant, be produce more leaf matter over stem matter, so they have higher nutritional content. Another thing that's good about it is we see a lot of people overseeding um, it cool season annuals into Bermuda grass, so you can almost have a year round grazing system. We're going to talk about that in more detail at the end of the presentation. Hopefully, if we can get there. And then, uh, so cons like I said, extensive management, a lot of soil for fertility is a big thing. It's going to be more particular in Bermuda grass than Bahia grass. Weed issues. Uh, if you got Bermuda grass, if you really want to keep up the stand, I'm going to say you might as well count on spraying for weeds at least twice a year, if not three times a year. You're going to need to fertilize at least once a year. You probably need to top dress at least another one, one or two times on top of that to really keep it going through the summertime. And then on top of that, we see fall armyworm, Bermuda grass stem maggot, grasshoppers can be an issue. So you're going to have to probably spray insecticides at least once a year for some kind of pest. And then, uh, one con is we generally down here, Bahia grass tends to have a little bit longer growing period, it tends to green up a little bit sooner in the spring and stay green a little bit longer in the fall than Bermuda grass. And then another con, Bermuda doesn't do as good in really wet sites. So you might want to, if you got a real low land area, you might want to go more with Bahia. And I include establishment as a con because if you don't have a very large piece of property, it can get hard to get somebody to come out there and sprig a, get somebody to come sprig a hybrid Bermuda on your place. So real quick, here's just a real quick list of varieties. It's a, there's a lot more varieties out there, but the seeded ones that are most com, common are the common Bermuda and the giant Bermuda that you see a lot. And then they got some blends that include some different seeded Bermudas together. But the hybrids are the ones that a lot of people really want, and that's the ones you got to get sprigged because their seeds are sterile. That'd be stuff like Alicia, Coastal, Jigs, Tifton 85. So that we spent a lot of time on Bahia and Bermuda because that's that's our mainstay here in East Texas. That's what the majority of y'all are going to use. Uh, I did want to touch on Sudan sorghum, or a lot of people call it hay grazer. I personally like this forage crop a lot. It doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, but it's a it's one of our warm season annuals we have here and it's basically a cross I guess you could call it a hybrid between Sudan grass and sorghum so maize or milo depending on what you call it and so it's a it, I, this basically it looks like a sorghum or a maize type plant good it's very fast growing reproduces by seed so you're gonna have to plant it every spring or early summer but it can produce a lot of leaf matter as you can see in this picture so I mean if you were a cow, I mean, that looks like something you'd really want to go eat. The downside to it is it can get eight feet tall, so it can get real stemmy and lose a lot of nutritional value on you real quick. So here's just some quick pictures of it. Um, you can see how when you cut it at the right time or graze it at the right time, which would be about four to five feet, it can be fairly thin stem and have a lot of leaf matter to it, but it can grow really fast and you have a really short window to actually either get your cows in on there or get it cut for hay because like this bottom left picture that would have been hay grazer when it was probably about 10 to 12 maybe 14 days after germinating and that far right picture that have been it in a windrow being cut probably about 30 days after that picture on the left where it just germinated maybe 30 40 days so it's a quick grower so pros high yielding high quality quick production you know if you got a 10 acre spot on your place that doesn't have anything on it and it's got good soil, you might want to consider planting this for either letting your cows graze on it or haying it. Uh, since it has such high yield, you can put a whole lot of cows out there really quick for when it's ready. And there is some thin stem varieties out there if you want to talk to your seed dealer. Uh, 
Cons, I tell people you basically got to become a farmer when you do hay grazer. It's a lot of management to it as you're basically growing a crop like you would corn or maize or cotton. So you need the equipment, you need a drill, you need some plows, you need a heavier duty your tractor, you need some land set aside for it. And then the input costs that come with that labor, diesel, seed. Like I kind of mentioned already, quality timing issues, you really have a small window to get in there on that. And I like to plant hay grazer real early in the spring to get the rain on it, but then that timing usually occurs in like May or June. And then it, we're still getting a lot of rain. So a lot of times you can't get in there and get it cut when it needs to be. You could wait later and plant it later in the spring, but then you get into summertime and then it might start getting dry and you don't get that production you want. And so the other thing is drying issues. If you do want to go with hay, even when you cut it at the right time, it still has a very thick stem. And even if you run it through a conditioner, it can still take three to five days for it to dry down to bale, which that's a that's a huge window here in East Texas with the weather. We very rarely get that, especially in May or June. Uh, we see some toxicity issues with nitrate and persic acid poisoning, and it's not tolerated of acidic soils, which probably isn't quite a big a deal. Maybe up y'all that are up in Northeast Texas, like in Brian's country, as much as it would be down here in Deep East Texas, where we have really sandy acidic soils. So real quick, I'm starting to run out of time here. Uh, I'm going to run through cool season annuals real quick. Uh, you, we, they're really, you can divide them up into three different categories, but I lumped them all together because really the pros and cons and a lot of management to them is the same. Uh, we have annual ryegrass. We have our small grains, rye, oat, wheat, and barley. And then we have clovers. There's more clovers in this, but I kind of listed the more common ones. And I put ryegrass and clovers as naturalized because a lot of, I mean, there ain't hardly a pasture in, in Polk County that doesn't have ryegrass that comes up voluntarily on its own in the spring unless somebody's actively spraying to get it out of their Bermuda grass. So even if you're not planting these clovers or ryegrass, there's a good chance you're going to have some of this forage in your pastures. So just quick pictures. That's ball clover on the top center, crimson clover on the far right. Y'all probably recognize crimson clover, textile plants, a lot of that along the right of ways here in East Texas. I did want to show y'all ryegrass, which is the picture with the pen, and then cereal rye, which is the picture in the bottom middle. Sometimes people get that confused. It's actually two different plants. They're not even in the same genus. They're totally different. So I got a couple minutes left and a couple slides. So pros of, of cool season annuals, you get that winter forage when you don't have your warm season crops growing. So you could potentially reduce your feed costs because you don't have to feed as much hay. Potentially increase cattle production because generally our cool season annuals are pretty high in protein content and have pretty good nutri nutritional quality to them. Uh, depending if you want to do clover or just ryegrass, you can just overseed that where you just get a spreader and you just kind of are, are a no-till drill and go put it out in your Bermuda grass stand. Or if you want to do a prepared seed bed, which is more common with the small grains, you actually go out there and break up your ground and do the whole nine yards. Uh, generally, most of it's used for pasture. A lot of guys will bale ryegrass for hay real early on if they have it. Some of the cons, you got to reestablish it annually unless you're just counting on what voluntarily comes up. You might have some additional equipment and land requirements. You might have to get a spreader or a drill. So input costs. Sometimes we have seed availability with cool season annuals. I know it was a two or three years ago, at least down in Polk County, it was either ryegrass or cereal rye. You couldn't hardly come by. And when you did, the cost just wasn't even worth it. So sometimes we see that issues. But the biggest thing I want y'all to realize with cool season annuals, especially ryegrass overseeded in the Bermuda, because a lot of people do that, is the potential for competition. Um, if you graze your ryegrass heavy enough or harvest it, it won't affect your Bermuda grass as much, but there is that potential in there. If you let your ryegrass get real tall, that it can start competing with your Bermuda grass or even your Bahia grass when it starts to green up in the spring for sunlight, for nutrients, for water. So you might take a hit on your Bermuda grass that, that year if your ryegrass gets too thick. So that's why some guys that grow just specifically Bermuda grass, they don't want ryegrass in their hay fields. So like I said, sometimes I see it weed and hay, mostly for pasture use is what we see here. And then if you do go the pre prepared seed bed route, if we get a lot of rain, especially if you're on like a more clay type soil, 
you're going to have muddy issues where you might start seeing foot rot in your cattle because it's just you break that soil up it just holds that water and gets real muddy so not only that but your cows are going to stomp it down in the mud and you might not you might destroy your whole cool season annuals in a couple days because your cows go stomp it all down in the mud so y'all can kind of review this in the slide later but i listed the cold tolerance for most to least maturity from earliest to latest and i want y'all to pay attention to maturity because that's going to you need to match a plant that matches your growth or what fits your livestock production because stuff that matures earlier such as cereal rye and wheat it's going to have more forage production in october november december january compared to ryegrass or oats which has most of its production in march april or may because it's a later maturing as cool season crop so if you want a lot of grazing in the spring go with ryegrass if you want to do some more fall and winter production go with some of the small grains legumes are also the option i know i didn't talk much about legumes that's the one non-grass on here but you Brian touched on this. Legumes fix nitrogen, so you don't have to worry about applying nitrogen if you're going the legume route. Legumes are like ryegrass, mostly spring production. So what a lot of people do is they do a mixture, they plant a mixture of small grains, ryegrass, and or legumes so that they can have winter cool season production from, you know, let's say October, November, all the way through April or May. So I got two more slides for y'all, but they're real quick. Um, the only thing I want y'all to look on this one is this was a study that was done in Overton and College Station. And I want y'all to see how total yield ryegrass outcompeted all our cool season grains of rye, wheat, and oats. But you have to keep in mind a lot of that production was just in the springtime. So your ryegrass didn't have anything going on when rye, wheat, and the oats probably did. And then this just kind of touches home on that one more time that the top two lines are going to be your. Uh, your wheat and your rye, your cereal rye, days after planting in the fall. And you can see how them lines are a lot higher because they have, they produce a lot more yield, like I said, in that October to December period compared to your oats and your ryegrass, which pick up later in the spring, as you can see in this graph, around 55 days after planting. And with that, I'll take a quick questions. I know it's probably time for Dr. Olson to jump on, if there's any. And I'll, I'll make my slides available for Casey too, if she wants to send them out. Do we have a quick question? Yes, sir. So our ryegrass right now is, not rye, excuse me, the, the bahia is about two feet tall right now. Yes, sir. But can we just leave it and let it, don't do anything with it right now, let my horses eat it down until next spring? Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, They'll eat it if they need it. I mean, it, you know, it's just extra forage there for you. So I wouldn't worry about it unless uh, I wouldn't worry about doing anything with it. You know, if you're if that's what you're feeding your horses and they're eating on it. So, yeah. OK, thank yeah. you. Thank you. OK, if you have any more questions for Matt, you can put them in the text chat. And uh, in the interest of time, we'll get Dr. Vanessa Corrier Olson, our extension forage specialist from our Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Extension Center at Overton uh, to join us now. And uh, she's going to visit about stocking rates and forage utilization. Thank you, Vanessa. All right. Thank you, guys. Like you said, my name is Vanessa Coyer Olson, and we're going to talk tonight about stocking rate and forage utilization. Um, so Brian and Matt have already talked about soil fertility and uh, forage species and variety selection and both of those can play a huge impact into the potential uh, for stocking rate and how those forages need to be managed to have optim or to optimize forage utilization without overgrazing <clears throat> as well as actually utilizing those forages that you have growing on your property. So first I just kind of want to remind us in something that we kind of need to remember that forages and grazing programs serve as the foundation for most if not all of our cow calf as and even some of our and a lot of our soccer operations now in east texas majority of us have, have cow calf or we may be supporting other livestock there's been quite a few questions about horses 
Um, but forage and even small ruminants, goats or sheep forages of some sort are going to be the foundation of those systems. And so it's something that we need to remember. Um, so sound management is going to be critical for success of those forages. And that's going to include managing, doing some grazing management to have optimum utilization. So there are several terms that you are going to hear or read from time to time from various sources. You may hear stocking rate, you may hear to those um, and try to define those more clearly because it can get very um, overwhelming and confusing at times. So stocking rate is the number of animals on a given amount of land over a certain period of time. Um, so in the, in how we typically format stocking rate is animals per acre. Um, kind of a ratio of the number of animals on an acre uh, for a given period of time. So that might be one um, animal, one cow-calf pair per 10 acres or one per 12, um, or it might be, you know, it might be one animal to three acres. Um, so it will just vary. The And what varies is the carrying capacity, and that is the actual sustainable stocking rate. And so instead of thinking that stocking rate is a hard and fast rule that no matter what our stocking rate should be one animal to five acres no matter what the conditions are that is not the case that is where carrying capacity comes into play where we have to take into effect environmental conditions we have to take into effect our management are we fertilizing those forages um, to promote production to promote persistence because if we're not fertilizing we're going to have very little forage production if we're overgrazing, we're going to have very little forage production if we have weed or brush encroachment that's going to reduce our grazable area that's going to reduce the amount of available forage for our livestock um, so we have to think in regards to all of those factors that affect forage production to determine what the actual carrying capacity is on our property, because there's so many factors that are going to influence that. Weather will also influence, obviously, during drought conditions, we have to be much more flexible with our stocking rates. We're not fertilizing. Um, we can also have reduced forage production in the high heat of the summer. Um, even for our warm season perennial forages, they're just going to, during the higher temperatures, they slow their growth. Um, they just as not are not as productive as they are in more moderate temperatures. So we're also with higher temperatures, going to have more evaporation of water, of any moisture that we have, and that will obviously impede forage production as well. So stocking rate is a set number that need we need to be flexible with because the carrying capacity of our land is going to be influenced by our management as well as weather conditions and even the forage that we're growing. Um, different forages will have different carrying capacity and need different stocking rates based on that. So something we need to remember that stocking rate is a constantly moving tar target. So like I said, it's not a hard and fast rule. Your stocking rate may be very different or needs to be very different than your neighbor or someone else that you know in your county, or it's definitely gonna be different than someone else in a different county or in a different part of the state. Um, so we have a lot of variability in our state in soil types, rainfall, and therefore we have variability in vegetation, and we're gonna have variability in management. The, the management that we need to employ based on those environments and forages that we're utilizing. So in order to, to kind of determine, determine your stocking rate, um, a very common question is how many acres do you need per cow? Now we're going to focus on cattle. Horses are very different. Um, we need to think about how different species utilize forages. Um, cattle do not have front teeth, so they do not graze as close as horses do. So horses can typically be much more damaging to our pastures than cattle. So historically, horses need to be at a lower stocking rate, so fewer animals per acre, oftentimes compared to, to cattle. So it'll be very dependent. Um, your stocking rate for horses will also be influenced by how much time are they actually in the pasture. Um, a lot of times our horses may be in a stall or in a barn, or maybe they're being used on other parts of our property, 
Um, so there's a lot of factors that would go into that. If you have more questions questions about stocking horses, I'd be happy to, to help you with that in regards to giving you some guidance because horses can be very abusive on property because they do have front teeth and they graze so much closer to the soil surface. Um, I'm sure many of us have driven down the road and seen horses basically in a dirt lot. Um, so if you have any questions in that specific and in regards to horses, I'll be happy to, to address that. But in regards to cattle, so determining your grazable acres. I know I think based on some of the comments and questions, um, Brian must have mentioned or introduced the WebSoul survey or another source looked like maybe from UC Davis. I tried to look at the link um, to, to kind of get a feel. That one I have not used. I historically use the WebSoul survey. I would say find one that you trust, you feel comfortable with, especially their interface. Sometimes one interface is easier to use than the other, but I'm just gonna talk about the WebSoul survey. So it is the best way to find it is just to Google it, use Bing or Yahoo for a search engine, just type in WebSoul survey and it will be the first thing that comes up. Um, so from there, go to the home website. This is what it will look like. And basically to start, you can just hit that green button. Now they do have some directions on their homepage. Um, so you can scroll down and they have a few directions if you'd prefer to read those before you actually start, um, start using this tool. So it is hosted by USDA and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Over long, for years, they've been collecting soil data across the United States and um, all over you know, Texas in your counties. You may be familiar, you used to be able to and I think you still can. A lot of counties still have the original soil maps, the actual physical paper um, that you can look at. So if you prefer that route, that's an option as well. But this is a great tool. Once you've selected the web soil survey, you can put in a physical address or a GPS coordinates. Most of us have cell phones. We can use that to mark a location on a map and then determine the GPS coordinates if you do not have a physical address for that property. If it's property that you're looking to purchase or inherit um, and it doesn't have a physical address um, and maybe you have a PO box instead, you can use those GPS coordinates. From there, it will narrow down to your property. Um, based on where the map lands, you may need to move the map with a, the hand icon at the top. You may need to rearrange the map so it's closer or encompasses all of your property. You can zoom in, zoom out, um, we won't spend a lot of time here, but the advantage of using the WebSoil survey or a tool I think Brian mentioned earlier is you can determine your total acreage. If you don't know that, um, you can also use that to determine your grazable acreage because you may have some wooded area, you may have water on your property, you may have some property that's at an elevation, that's at a slope that is not desirable for grazing, that um, animals cannot access very easily. For most of us in East Texas, we don't have a lot of rock issues. Um, you may have a, a wetland um, designation on your property that maybe you don't want to graze or don't need to graze, but this is a great tool to actually determine your grazable acreage. How many acres do you have that cattle can actually access and graze and where you can actually grow a forage? And that might be part of it too. But even even property that's productive that can actually grow vegetation or grow forage may not be grazable. Um, so this is a good tool just to, to determine how many acres do you actually have. You may own 250 acres, but 50 of that might actually be woods that you know just grows brush and trees and um, whatnot as opposed to viable forage for livestock. Um, so that's an excellent tool. Um, so now, after you know your grazable acreage, you have to know how much forage they're consuming. Um, and forage consumption is going to be based on, historically based on body weight as well as level of production. So some general intake guidelines, a dry gestating cow will consume 1.8 to about 2% of her body weight. A lactating cow, so in a cow-calf production system, a lactating cow somewhere from 2.3 to 2.5% of her body weight. So obviously body weight is a factor as well and we'll see how that plays out here in a minute. Other something else that we have to take into account is the forage species and the nutritive value or the quality of that forage. 
And so Matt introduced several different species. He didn't, he went through that very quickly. So he didn't have a lot of time per se to, to focus on potential nutritive value. But most of our forage systems in East Texas and throughout the Southeast is based on a warm season perennial forage, Bermuda grass or Bahia grass or a native perennial or other uh, perennial species typically a grass. And then we utilize other species, cool season annuals or warm season annuals that are going to be higher in nutritive value than that warm season perennial. So an annual is always going to be higher in nutritive value than a perennial. And a cool season forage is always going to be higher in nutritive value than a warm season forage. Um, so that is something to think about. So in regards to utilizing some of those cool season annuals, they are much higher in nutritive value than those warm season perennials. Um, so something to think about is forage quality declines, forage intake is going to decrease. Now forage quality can be influenced by the species or the variety of that species that you're growing. It can also be influenced by fertility, how much fertilizer, how much especially nitrogen you're applying to those grasses. It's also going to be influenced by the time of year, especially during the summer, like I mentioned in the, the high heat, our nutritive value on our warm season perennials will actually decline as well. It kind of in the middle of the summer, that July, August, when we're, you know, even, you know, 80, 90 degrees at night, potentially hitting triple digits when we're really hot, that forage production declines as well as the nutritive value declines. So a higher quality forage, you're going to have higher intake. So if your livestock are grazing cool season annual ryegrass, they're going to consume quite a bit of that forage as opposed to if they were grazing Bermuda grass in the high heat of the summer or even Bahia grass in that high heat of the summer, um, they're going to typically have a lower intake. So the forage they're grazing will influence their intake as well. So estimated annual intake, if we assume a cow consumes 2.25% of her body weight, and that was a, um, a gestating animal, then if she weighs 1,000 pounds, you multiply that by that 2.25%. So that means she's consuming 22.5 pounds of dry matter per day. If you multiply that by 365 days in a year, if you're going to be grazing majority of the year, then she's consuming ultimately within that 365 days over 8,000 pounds of dry matter um, per year. So that's quite a bit of forage. Now the next question is, should you let the cows consume everything that is produced? All of the Bermuda grass, all of the Bahia grass, all of the rye grass, um, or whatever you're consuming? And the answer is, is no, especially if you're grazing warm season perennials, we want them to regrow. And we will see later with some images the impact of overgrazing on those pastures on that forage production. Something I like to say is it takes grass to grow grass. Um, even though Bermuda grass and Bahia grass tolerate close continuous grazing, we still do not need to graze that pasture down to the dirt or down to the soil level. Um, so typically for our introduced species, such as Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, Johnson grass, um, Old World Blues, um, um, Johnson grass, some other uh, warm season perennials that are introduced, we can let them consume about 70%. Um, and that still allows for regrowth because we're not grazing down to the soil surface. So if she's going to consume 70% and she needs eight, over 8,000 pounds of dry matter per year, then you actually need to grow almost 12,000 pounds of forage for that, that one animal that weighs 1,000 pounds because she's consuming 2.25% of her body weight on a daily basis. Um, so, and that's over a year's time. So 12,000 pounds, about 12,000 pounds of dry matter per year. Um, so when we look at our warm season perennials, Bermuda grass and Bahia grass and consuming 70% um, of that forage. So if our forage allowances is 70%, um, her intake based on a thousand pounds is a little over 8,000 pounds of dry matter. Um, that's her intake per per year. So per year you need over 13, about 14,000 pounds of dry matter because we've also added that calf intake as well. So that's included, increased the total intake, so therefore increased our forage allowance. So if our forage production is 6,000 pounds of dry matter per acre per year, and that's on a well-managed or that's what we're managing for 
um, if that's the amount of forage we're producing and based on what she needs, our stocking rate would be a little over two acres per cow-calf pair. <clears throat> so obviously the next thing you're going to see as you see the additional columns here on the chart, as we increase that body weight of, of that cow and that calf, then they're going to increase how much forage they need. That means increases how much forage we need to grow to support those animals, which is going to shift our stocking rate, meaning we may need more acreage to support that cow-calf pair because they are consuming more forage. Um, so if we go on to 1,400 pound cow, we're going to see a jump to, let's see if I move my little box, to over three acres per cow-calf pair. And so make sure you notice that it's acre per pair and not animal per acre. So three acres, over three acres per, per cow-calf pair. Um, now and that is during, that is with good growing conditions. So what happens if we have um, poor growing conditions? It could be a drought and maybe we're not fertilizing as heavily. And so we do not have the same level of forage production. We have the same size animals with the same needs, but we're only producing 4,500 pounds of dry matter per acre. That is going to shift our stocking rate. So we need more acres to support that pair over three getting well into four acres per cow calf pair because we're not producing that forage. So there are so many things to think about and that is why stocking rate has to be a moving target. Every year is not going to be your most productive year. Could be for various reasons, some out of your control. Um, this year Bermuda grass production has just not been quite what it has been in the past. We had a very cool May. We had a lot of rain in the spring. But we had a very cool May. So Bermuda grass was delayed and really becoming productive in East Texas. And so that reduced our forage production this season potentially. And so uh, people may have needed to or should have or hopefully did adjust their stocking rate so they didn't overgraze those forages. Um, so we have to be very flexible. It's also going to depend on our, our management. Now, if we looked at other forages, Matt mentioned native forages. Um, like he said, there's not necessarily a lot grown in East Texas. Um, he showed you some of those pictures of what East Texas and different parts of, you know, the post oak savannah and the Blackland prairies and East Texas actually looked like the Piney Woods um, historically. And, and the Piney Woods was called the Piney Woods because there was a lot of trees. There were a lot of pine trees um, and not necessarily a lot of of grazing per se, but we've turned it into grazing, obviously, with our introduced forages. Um, but if you were in a different part of the state and you were grazing native forages, those have to be managed very differently because our native species, such as the big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, um, gamma grass, um, grama, eastern, eastern grama, any of our switchgrass, any of our native grasses, their growth point on that plant is considerably higher, whereas Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, their point of regrowth is closer to the salt surface. That is why we can graze them shorter compared to our native species. Typically on our native species, we need to leave uh, about 10 to 12 inches of stubble height for that forage to even regrow. If we grazed it down to the soil level, those native species would not regrow. You would basically graze them out completely. Um, so stocking rate would have to be adjusted because we cannot utilize as much of that forage. Only about 25% um, would be appropriate to utilize of those native forages if you were grazing them with animals. So that changes our stocking rate. That means we need considerably more acreage, almost 13 acres for a thousand pound cow with her calf um, to support that one pair. So native forages require very different management than our improved or introduced species. Um, they are much more tolerant of that kind of close continuous grazing. They tolerate a little bit higher stocking rate. However, we can still be abusive to those forages. So management is, is going to be key. So the factors that affect forage production, um, you know, Brian spent a lot of time talking about soil fertility and nutrients, very important, has a huge impact on yield, the amount of forage we produce, the nutritive value, as well as the persistence. Other factors, rainfall. Rainfall is, is outside of our control. Some people have irrigation. It's not as common in East Texas because we do tend to have higher average annual rainfall. 
Um, so your rainfall can influence, obviously, forage production. We all know that. Our soil type. Um, this is a map showing the vegetational areas of Texas, and there is great soil variability. Um, if you actually saw a soils map for, for Texas, it's considerably more colorful than this picture actually is. This kind of just narrows it down a little bit more. <clears throat> but soil type has an impact on forage production. Our sandy soils in East Texas typically are very infertile. They don't hold on to nutrients very well, so they're not naturally very productive, especially for our grasses, so they require inputs. Heavier clay soils are, can be more productive. They hold on to nutrients much more substantially. So where you are in the state for rainfall and soil type can influence your forage production um, and therefore influence your, your stocking rate. Oh, I just passed. The drought, drought weather obviously has a huge impact on forage production. Uh, most of us remember the drought of 2011. This is the most recent um, current conditions for drought. Um, looking at the entire United States, you can see things are shifting in Texas. Um, the best way to locate this map, just Google U.S. Drought Monitor. These are current conditions. You can look at forecast. Um, you can, from this map, you can click on Texas until you get down to just the state of Texas where it's broken out into counties. And that can be helpful to determine the conditions in your, in your specific area. Most of us know what our conditions are, whether we've had rain or not, whether we're starting to get very dry. Um, so we may need to adjust our stocking rates based on upcoming drought, um, as well as potentially current dry conditions that we might have. So something I like to say is I would rather have, and I'm always a safe, you know, play it safe, better safe than sorry type of person. That's my personality. Um, but I think it would be, and I think it is a lot easier to manage excess forage as it is to have to go out and purchase hay. Um, because typically, if oftentimes, if you're purchasing hay, a lot of other people are too. That can drive the price up. That can create an opportunity to, to introduce species that you don't want on your property or could increase some, some toxicity risk or some, um, some health risk for your livestock. So I would rather have excess forage. And there's a couple of ways we can, we can manage that. We, can, um, we could lease our property. We could bring in additional animals. Um, we could maintain or retain heifers um, or um, stalkers potentially, depending on the time of year and the production system we're in. We could allow calves, we could keep calves a little bit longer. Now, obviously, a lot of those decisions need to also be made around the market. Um, so that may not be the best scenario for you, but that is an option to bring in more animals to, to help graze or utilize that additional forage. Um, other options, we could dial back on our fertility. We could save some money in fertilizer to, um, you know, to kind of slow our production temporarily. Now, we need to think about the long-term consequences of that. Um, I would still apply any phosphorus or potassium, but you could reduce the amount of nitrogen you're applying. Um, you could, so you could potentially save some money in that fertility department if you have quite a bit of forage that you're not utilizing or you're not capable of utilizing at that time. There's multiple means of harvesting. Baleage can be an option, especially for our cool season annual grasses that are growing in that springtime when we do tend to have a lot of moisture. It's much easier oftentimes to harvest those forages for baleage, uh, which is a higher moisture content uh, stored forage as opposed to dry hay. Dry hay is obviously an option as well. Um, no matter what the forage species is, that is an option. Weather and timing could, could play an impact into that. You could, if you didn't have equipment, you could potentially hire someone to custom bale for you and then store that forage for a situation where you had reduced forage production, be it a drought or a flood, uh, maybe a storm or what have you. So there's multiple ways we can utilize those forages um, if we have excess, excess, excuse me. So once again, like I said, it takes grass to grow grass. And so these are some great illustrations on how our grazing management influences the overall health of that plant. So this is a really old picture, black and white, it's probably older than me, um, but it really drives home the point. 
And so to actually put this with some real life situations. So we started at the far left where we have overgrazed. That forage has been grazed down or overgrazed and you have very li little next to no root structure. Um, so that's impossible for that forage to recover from that severe of or that poor of grazing management and that severe of overgrazing. That is when you start to see weed encroachment or brush encroachment. You also start to see weight loss. If you've probably already seen weight loss on your animals before you get to this severe of a situation. The next plant from the left, um, not, not as overgrazed, obviously, but still grazed down. You see there, you know, there's some forage out there, but it's pretty short. Um, so we still have reduced root structure. If they continued into an extremely dry situation, they could ultimately end up in the same situation in the previous picture, especially if they're overstocked. If they have too many animals that are keeping that forage grazed entirely too short and not allowing that forage to recover. Um, as those plants grow, as they produce root, as they produce leaves in order to photosynthesize and produce additional uh, plant growth, as they produce those leaves, they have to pull from that root structure. So that's why in grazing, we're killing or losing part of that root structure because that plant is having to pull from those root reserves to produce leaf area that can then photosynthesize, produce food, grow more roots, grow more top growth, and provide forage for livestock. A better situation, you can see there's quite a bit of forage out here. Very little weeds, sure, there's a few, but it's it's nothing, nothing major. Um, you ha you're going to have an excellent root structure. You could, you know, depending on weather conditions and forecast, um, they could possibly increase their stocking rate, but they're probably better off not to um, in case they did end up in a drought. And if they did end up in a drought, they could actually continue to graze for a longer period of time as opposed to those two previous pictures that we saw. Obviously, this is an excellent scenario. We have you know quite a bit of forage out there so we're going to have a substantial root structure um this pup more than likely i know these pictures are just one part of a pasture and this is probably they're probably able to operate a higher stocking rate because they have more forage allowance out there um, they have you know more forage out there as opposed to some of those previous pictures so we are going to impact you know the the um, nutrients of our livestock by overgrazing and we're also going to impact that root structure. And the consequences of overgrazing are going to be different depending on the forage species. So the native species that I mentioned earlier will not recover from overgrazing, um, would probably actually have to be reestablished and establishing um, native species can take several years. They're very slow to germinate, very slow to establish. Um, so that's why management is very important. Overgrazing our warm season perennials, um, they can recover. Recovery will be dependent on nutrient status within our soil. If our soil is deficient of nutrients, it will require some additional inputs. If we've allowed weeds to take over, it will require some pesticides, some herbicides to eliminate that competition for those forages to recover. And Anytime we have overgrazed pastures, we need to let them rest, whether it's a native or a, a, a introduced species such as Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. We have to remove animals, let that plant recover and regrow. Um, so depending on our previous management will depend on how quickly our introduced forages will recover. Um, so a lot of people that had abused their Bermuda grass and Bahia grass prior to the drought of 2011 lost their stands and ended up having to replant. Um, and that means not having utilization of that forage of that pasture for at least a year. So our management can really have an impact on our, our forage production, our stocking rate, um, uh, the recovery of our forages if they are overgrazed or if they have to endure a stress event, uh, whether it's drought or a combination of overgrazing and drought. So forage Grazing management is is very critical part of our forage production systems. So just remember, it takes grass to grow grass. Um, I do have a website if you're interested in additional forage information, foragefacts.tamu.edu. 
you can actually subscribe to this website anytime. Every Friday, I try to post a, a short article, try to keep them very brief and relevant to the time of year, what's going on, what are some issues or things I'm getting a lot of questions about. Um, there's excellent publications on forage topics, weed control, um, what have you. So a lot of on hay production. Um, so an excellent, or I think it's an excellent resource for forage information if you are seeking additional information. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I'll second that on that Forage Facts website, Vanessa. I mean, us agents are so thankful for that. I know I utilize it a lot to answer questions. So it's very good resource. It's a, a very good resource. Does anybody have any questions? Not seeing any more come in. No, not seeing it, any at the moment. Um, okay. And if y'all come up with questions later, you can always uh, reach out to us, email us, ask us, and we can get back to you or it was a question about one of the specialists or one of the presentations what they might have might have said um you know we can always get that information back for you yeah i just put my email address in the in the 